Howdy, folks. Thank you for quickly getting back to your seats. I'm so grateful for that. Does my voice carry into the foyer? Do you think it does? Ladies and gentlemen in the foyer, we are getting started imminently. Please come in at this moment. And for those who can hear me, we're going to do our usual process of clapping and stomping. If you can hear me, please clap twice. Four times. So we're going to try something new and fun. When I count to three, I'd like you to all start clapping and try to synchronize your clapping. And you have to figure it out on your own as a group. One, two, three. Thank you. Wisdom of crowds. How wonderful. All right, so we're running a tiny bit late, um, but we're relatively on track for lunch, and I'm very excited to kick off this new conversation that we're having as our last session before lunch. This is a session that's focused on sharing the message of regeneration, of grasslands restoration, at the level of mass scale. And the first speaker that we have to share about this has a lot of experience in a very beautiful way in doing so. His name's John Liu. Uh, he's a filmmaker, a journalist by background, in many ways a person beyond introduction. Um, his his uh, seminal uh, movie, a documentary film that was made, focused on the restoration of a specific landmass in China that was severely degraded and shifted in many beautiful ways. I'll let him share more. Um, but his background has been, as a filmmaker, capturing the beauty of, of restoration of ecological landscapes in ways that is, is receivable by people who are not just in this kind of a tribe, but who are less uh, cognizant of the kinds of things that are going on ecologically, and yet still are able to receive the message. John, please come join us. I'm very shy. It's going to be difficult to uh, overcome that. Hi, Joel. We don't know each other, but I'm a big fan. Uh, I, I have to start with gratitude because I've had the privilege of going to many places around the world. And for the last three years, I was a fellow, uh, research fellow with the IUCN and now the Kaman Foundation and the Ecosystem Return Foundation are supporting my, my efforts. And I have to, if I go back 20 years since I sort of stopped doing journalism, I have to kind of wear one of those Formula One suits because uh, I've had the, the opportunity to go to many places supported by many different organizations um, and I guess, as, as, as was mentioned, the, the research I started to do, uh, a little bit more, uh, in 1995, was in China's List Plateau. And this is the cradle of civilization for the Chinese race. So the largest ethnic group on the planet came from this place. And this was the home of the Han, the Qing, the Tang dynasties, where much of the greatest art and scientific uh, discoveries in early human civilization comes from. And in 1995, when I went there for the first time, I was absolutely the largest ethnic group on the planet could come from a place that looks like the moon. And, of course, here's a picture which bothers uh, Alan. But uh, what I saw was the end game in, in this. And a cycle of 
responsibility and ecological destruction from the actions of human beings over generations to continuously destroy the functioning of the ecosystems. People became poor. And so the more they, they tried to do the same unsustainable agricultural activities, the worse the situation became. And they, they passed it to the next generation because the behaviors were learned. And the people in this area were living in, in dwellings more or less like caves. Actually, they're kind of efficient. Um, if you, they're a little bit like super insulated passive solar earth architecture, but the people were not happy. And, and part of it was that they were in the sunlight a lot. There was no shade. They had to go inside. And they were burning all of the biomass. They were burning dung and any crop waste. And so there was no organic matter in the soil. And it was, it was pretty stunning to go there. And I became obsessed. And it's still now 20 years later, and I'm still studying this. So this is a film we made that needs to be up at full for the Copenhagen. Conference. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture. And generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. As a result of its success, the lessons learned from the Lus Plateau rehabilitation are now being applied all over China. But could such projects work elsewhere in less centrally controlled societies with fewer resources and different soils? Ethiopia, perhaps more than any other country, has come to symbolize the vulnerability of humankind to environmental catastrophe. This is a country whose problems have been increased by war and civil conflict. And now, human-induced climate change is predicted to make matters worse. As on the Luce Plateau, centuries of subsistence farming practices have stripped the land of natural vegetation. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. Yeah, that route could survive? No? no, no in just six survive. years, Professor Lagessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover, which has been regenerating 
on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy, on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. If we were to restore the vast areas of the planet where we humans have degraded the soils, just think what an impact we would have in taking carbon out of the atmosphere. As much as a quarter of the world's land mass has been degraded, and much could be rehabilitated in the way we have seen on the Luz Plateau. And we've only just begun to recognize the real value of natural capital. Surely investing in the recovery of damaged environments is a cost-effective way of solving many of the problems we face today. What we've seen in China, in Africa, and around the world is that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. If we can transfer the capital, the technology, and empower the local people to restore their own environment, it'll have enormous benefits. Restoration can sequester carbon, reduce biodiversity loss, mitigate against flooding, drought, and famine. It can ensure food security for people who are now chronically hungry. Why don't we do this on a global scale? That's a good question. So this film was broadcast just before the Copenhagen COP15. 87 million people, I'm told, were viewing on BBC Worldwide. It was shown five times that day. It was shown again on the 1st of January in uh, the next year, 2010. And it's been shown throughout Africa on a number of channels in the United States on PBS, in China, where I, I guess if you put it on, it's about 100 million viewers. So this is now embedded in the, in the uh, curriculum for the Vietnamese government. And they have, uh, every school child has to watch this. Um, in Rwanda, I went first in 2006 and I was able to speak to the president, the prime minister, the cabinet, the parliament, the ministries of environment and agriculture. And uh, at the end, I left. They sent me a letter saying, thank you for coming to, to share this with us. And then they sent me another letter. And they said, we've rewritten our land use policy laws. And we're connecting economic growth to ecological function. They have 8.2% economic growth for the last five years over and during a global recession. So, and then I met, Alan called me, and I met Tony, and then I met Mike and Emma. And this is Emma moving 3,000 head of cattle with a whistle into some of the most wonderful biodiverse fields. Alan told me I had to rethink my, my feelings about grazing animals. So I went to Australia. <laughs> These are the cows you want to eat. Come on! There's no dip, no antibiotics, no pesticides, no herbicides. If a cow dies, they quickly dig a hole and bury it, and it strengthens the herd because that animal's not going to breathe. They can increase the size and the amounts of animal protein by increasing, while simultaneously increasing hydrological function and biodiversity. It's astonishing. So, 
I hope we'll continue to work with uh, Savory. Yes. Institute. Who said that? Oh, he did. Mike is on my side. And, uh, and that we can document these things and show them around the world. Damn help, big Tesla. Did you? And the family, and I, when, you know, when mainly, you were down in that corner, um, does their homework and goes swimming. Well, Lynn, I don't want anything to do with car and, 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 and I want not quite and, and if, and their neighbors are, are going crazy because they're they're seeding their fields, they're harvesting, and, and they're feeding. Ah! And they're feeding. Ah! And it's bizarre. And then they have all these just pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical costs and, <laughs> and chemical costs. Their fields look like crap. Uh, it, yeah, it's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 when, and they, I also think, you know, the feedlot industry, it will be interesting to see how uh, sustainable that is. To, to be harvested, yeah. they just walk onto the, to the truck because they're so bite-sized. They never they have their feet. It's interesting. So I started to get real philosophical. I think we need a little sound for this, I'm sure, just a little bit. But what, what I realized was that my mother always told me, you know, that Adam and Eve emerged in the Garden of Eden. And then I started studying evolution and I found that there was this long progression from a molten rock surrounded by poisonous gases and it emerges into and through photosynthesis and atmosphere emerges and then the soil and the hydrological cycle and so on. And what I realized was it doesn't matter. Either way you look at that story, human beings emerge in paradise because our period on the earth is relatively short if you take the scientific look at it. And the earth is a magnificent planet. It has an excellent atmosphere, wonderful hydrological cycle. The biodiversity is incredible. The fertility in the soil is extraordinary. So I had started out by looking at massively degraded systems. So I got kind of fascinated with, like, what's it supposed to be like? So because of all these lovely sponsors, I've been able to go around the world a lot. And uh, I've seen many places in every continent of the Earth. And there are closed canopies. There are intact savannas and steppes. There's large ungulate migrations still in certain places. And <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with the Earth. It's human beings who are interrupting long-term evolutionary trends. And I started to, I, actually this all came about because I was following this and then at some point um, someone said, well you have to speak to the Yellow River, Yellow River Forum. It's a scientific forum. And I had no idea what that was like. And I went there. And they were toasting each other with champagne. And they gave me a glass of champagne. And, and they said, uh, we've just enacted a, a new global treaty that every signatory will now write environmental flows into their discussions of river systems. That's a cheetah nursing in the Maasai Mara. This is hanging out of a helicopter in Chiapas. Highly recommended. Take gaffer's tape. Um, but at this conference in the, Ye uh, the Yellow River Forum, I, I didn't want to drink their champagne. And I thought, aren't you a little late in realizing that rivers have environmental flows? like? <laughs> like millions of years late? I mean, 
it, it's, it's, it's crazy. And um, I, 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 I was going to hit somebody, so I went, went away and went to bed. And when I woke up in the morning, I thought, hmm, you know, maybe I'm wrong, because that means every little official in all the countries that sign that document have to write environmental flows in every document. And the first time he does that, it's not going to mean anything. He's just got to do it. But the more he does it, then he's going to wonder, like, what is that thing that I'm writing in there about environmental flows? And at some point, maybe after the 17th time he writes it, that's Paramo in the high Andes. Um, you know, he's going to know what it is. And that's a good thing. So I felt better the next day. Then I went to do the speech. And the top scientists about rivers from all over the world are there. And nobody's listening to them. And, it, and you, if you were, you were, you couldn't understand them anyway. And people are falling asleep and they're drooling. And it's, it's horrible. <laughs> and then I have to come up and speak. And no one knows who I am. And I've never given a public lecture, certainly not in a scientific thing. There must have been a 1,000 people there or something. And um, so I do my thing with video from the transition in the Lewis Plateau and the yellow, up, up, upstream, up, upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. And there's stunned silence in the room. And then I'm rushed by two types of people the top scientists and the youngest students. Everybody else is terrified that I'm there. It's very funny. <laughs> and then I got a fellowship to the Rothamsted Research Institute. This is the oldest soil and agriculture institute uh, research station in, in, in the UK and in the world. They have carbon studies going back to the time of Malthus. They created the carbon C models, which started the measurement of carbon in the atmosphere. They created pesticides and herbicides and artificial fertilizers. I don't know why they gave me a fellowship, but they, they made me the Rothamsted International Fellow for the Communication of Science. And when I went to Africa, boy, the Africans really respected that, because they'd all heard of Rothamsted, it's, and they all wanted to go there. So I was the Rothamsted International Fellow. And what I found is that whether you look from a religious cosmology or evolution, we sinned, and we we broke the natural laws. And paradise was lost over vast areas of the planet. And it's unnecessary because it's not an inevitability. It's possible to restore these systems. But in order to restore these systems, you have to understand them. And it seems to me, I looked in China first, but then I've been all over the world. All the cradles of civilization are virtually the same. They all had the same outcome. They cut the trees, they used unsustainable agriculture, and the end game is, un, is, is relentless grazing. But this is our time, and we have a task. And restoring ecological function is the only way we're going to survive. I think that's been said a, a few times. This is dune stabilization. All you do is put straw into sand. The water flows in there. It starts to degrade. Birds leave their droppings. Seeds blow up. And you get vegetation without even planting it. How many billions of people do we have at the edges of large degraded ecosystems with nothing to do? Let's get some straw. Yes, please. It's really feeding the soil. The compost 
This is Thomas Luthi, the head of the Demeter. two months ago, and um, the first thing which happens is that it turns warm. And if they put up the material in the right way, with the right moisture and air and so on, all those beings, they come by themselves. Right. Here they are. Yeah. Here there is no warmth, but lots of organic material, and they have to do. So they are here, yeah. but after some time they will have done their work and who knows, perhaps they go over there. The worms and other beetles and um, microorganisms have been eating all of it mm -hmm. and produced this wonderful soil that's in a way the secret of organic material. Uh -huh. It improves the soil. Mm -hmm. It's not only nutrition, yeah. it's also structure. Yeah. Yeah. And it keeps the nutrition, it keeps the water and the air in the soil. This is Rene Holler. He's actually Yoda. He takes totally degraded mine tailings and then he makes it into the garden. The most important thing is to, to as fast as possible, get vegetations, uh, vegetation to grow. And uh, that can be again uh, done in, in very adverse areas. We have longer uh, what versions. What happens now, there's hardly a place in this quarries down there which has no vegetation. There's grass, there's trees, everything. Before, you know, it was uh, two and a half square kilometers of, of, of desert. All over the world are really spectacular techniques for restoration. And grassland restoration, of course, is enormously important because there's so much grasslands. We have a film called um, Forests Keep Drylands Working. You might want to look at that. We have a number of other films. All our films are available for you, for you to use. Um, I'm, someone's giving me kind of bad vibes back there, so I'm supposed to speed up, I think. Um, this is the learning village in Baviansklof. I've just spent six weeks there. This is a working for water and working for wetlands program, uh, which is a public works program. One of the things that I found in many parts of the world is that there are billions of people and these billions of people must be engaged in restoring the earth. They have nothing else to do. And, you know, they're not going to be building malls and fast food restaurants anytime soon. And that's not going to save them anyway. Because the other fellows who don't have a job are going to go in there and shoot them up. And they've already done that in Nairobi. And uh, so we need to think really carefully. This holistic idea means that there's 7.2 billion people on the earth, and all of them have equal rights. It's not about the owners. It's about the people. And we're not really owners, because we're going to die. So we're here for a very short time. And everywhere in the world, this can work. And this is exactly what the policy and the science tells us must happen. I'm going to plug on here. Um, a little bit I've been thinking about economic thoughts. And right now we define the money system as everything which is produced and consumed. But really it becomes waste very quickly. And the natural system is zero in that, in that reckoning. 
and all the pollution and health impacts and climate change, those are externalities. Well, my mother tells a story of Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln says to a young boy, if you call a, a dog's tail a leg, how many legs does the dog have? And the boy says five. And Abraham Lincoln says, no, the dog has four legs because calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. <laughs> and I think we have to tell the economists that, you know, calling health impacts or climate change or pollution or degradation or poverty or disparity or hunger or despair an externality is a lie and it doesn't reflect the truth and it means that there's a falsehood at the center of human economy and human society and that has to be eradicated in order to get a different result because it's corrupt and it's corrupting. In uh, the Bioneers in California, I got everyone to repeat after me. You want to give it a try? So if everybody could say ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than the production and consumption of goods and services. Now can you remember that? Can you say that to other people? Can you tweet that or whatever it is that's happening? Because if the, if the critical mass of humanity were to say that and believe it, then money would be based on ecological function and all human activity would go toward conservation and restoration. And it would be much easier to protect the rights of the billions of people who are now landless. And how did they become landless exactly? How did that happen? Oh, I'm getting like a, like I'm, get, I'm getting the hook. I, I just wanted to tell you that uh, we have a large number of programs. They're available to you. And we're producing a new television series. There's music under this if you want to let it go. These are the niece of Nelson Mandela's. You, you, you missed the, uh, the actual uh, chickens. It's on a biodynamic farm and the chickens are in the background. But this is going to be part of the soundtrack for our new film, which is Finding, it's part of a series called Finding Common Ground the art of healing the earth. I hope we can work with all of you. Um, let this music run, please, for just a little bit, because they're gonna do something amazing. I, I can't make it go any faster. <laughs> These are just children, but they're angels.
Thank you, John. So um, we are just about ready for lunch. The hotel's just putting the finishing touches on the meal there. I have a quick question for everyone. Who in this room knows about Weston Price? Hey, hey, we're in a good room. So I'm gonna introduce you to a new friend of mine. He's just got a few words before we break for lunch. Uh, Philip Ridley uh, found out about Weston Price and just made it a phenomenon in the UK. It had kind of sat stagnant for a while. There wasn't a lot of, um, of traction going on here, a lot of very interested people, but they didn't have an amazing organizer. And Philip felt the calling and uh, learned about the movement. So he's gonna tell you a little bit about it just to kind of put us in a frame of mind to think about our food before we go eat. And uh, it's gonna be amazing. So Philip Ridley. Thank you very much, Chris, for inviting me, and um, it's been an honor to have a, a booth out in the foyer there. I don't know if we have that. Let's see. Uh, view. Well, I know that you'll all be ready for lunch, and uh, hopefully this can inspire your appetite. Um, we, the, the Western A. Price Foundation, I'm glad that so many of you heard of it, but... Um, I'm particularly pleased to be speaking in front of a crowd like this. Speaking with Chris, I learned a lot about um, the, the philosophical approach of the Savory Institute, which is the holistic management of the land. Um, and with, with the Western A. Price Foundation, take a similar holistic approach. And we, we kind of veer, um, we start from the healthy soil. and. Our emphasis moves more, a bit more towards human nutrition, but I think this is an area that um, farmers should you know, uh, become increasingly aware of because their customers are, as well as the land and the environment, are the, the, the key outcome from this process. So we, we start off with um, asking the question, what, what is a healthy diet? And th there's, there's, there's a government dietary guideline, which is low fat, high carbohydrate. Uh, and we, it's come up, it, the food pyramid, it, it's really given us a generation of pyramid-shaped people. But what you find at the bottom is there's a massive um, supply of, of, of carbohydrates, grain products. Really, this, this diet was... was um, pushed by the commodity agriculture sector, you find it's grains, you know, and, and the lean meat that's being promoted, it's the grain-fed, factory-fed animal, and, and the processed dairy products, the skim milk, pasteurized, homogenized milk, it, it really, we see that things that um, were once considered, you know, weren't available, and now the new health foods, and the very things that our ancestors would, would focus on to be healthy have been shifted from our diet. So we, we begin with the healthy soil by saying that, you know, a lot of these things, red meat, animal fats, they become healthy when the animal is healthy and when they are grass-fed out in the sunshine. The key finding of Dr. Price was that um, he... he, he traveled the world in the, the 30s and um, 1930s looking for isolated tribes and asking what, how come these people look so healthy and, and what, what are the differences? And, and when he analyzed their foods, he found that they had 10 times more minerals and water-soluble vitamins in their diet. And, sorry, four times. And, and, but the key finding was there were 10 times more fat-soluble vitamins. That's A, D, and K2. And he took the food samples home and, and tested them. And, and the ratio is much worse now with, with modern food. Um, did, I'll just um, very, very briefly run through what, one of the case studies. Uh, so these are Alaskan, Alaskan people, and it, it's one of the most furthest removed from the modern diet. And he found it incredibly... Um, high degree of health. Um, the, he was a dentist, and you notice the, the teeth are like rolls, a, a row of pearls. And 
the um, 80% of the calories were from animal fat, from um, seal oil. And they, um, they also consume plenty of game animals. Now, one, one of the things that they would favor is the organ meats, the bone marrow, and the animal fat. And when we analyze these foods, they're the highest in these fat-soluble vitamins. Um, and, and every, every um, a, a tribe that he met had a sacred food. In, in this case, it was fish eggs. And what we find is that these are the, these are the cholesterol-rich foods, the ones we're told not to eat. Um, fish roe is actually the highest in cholesterol of any food. And in fact, salmon and a and, and, and lot of other fish actually have higher cholesterol than beef, for example. Yet, those are promoted as healthy and, we're told, avoid cholesterol. But it, it's in the avoidance of these, um, these foods that we, we see degeneration um, in part. Um, so here's a healthy um, group of, of Indians from Florida that were photographed. And what we find is the degeneration. When, when you move away from this healthy diet based on what back then would have to be holistic farming and picking the nutrient-dense foods from that, the first generation on these foods, you see a lot of tooth decay. That's what he identified. And he could see the same genetic lines, one with a modern food source, one with, a, with the traditional foods. The first generation would have the tuberculosis, dental decay. What really worried Dr. Price was that the second generation would have um, the bone structure wouldn't form properly. So we see this, and a modern medicine and dentistry hides a lot of these things, but if you see um, the modern school run, a lot of the children have braces correcting the, um, the jaw and, and they'll have um, wearing glasses. We're making the argument that this is chronic malnutrition, principally from a deficiency in the fat-soluble vitamins. And one of the key ones is, is that they, um, to support the low-fat hypothesis, um, vitamin A was reclassified so that beta-carotene could be um, called vitamin A. But children can't really make the conversion. So you've got all these parents giving their kids lots of carrots, and they can't make the conversion. And then you see vitamin A deficiency, for example. This is one of the key ones that we look at. And when they used to have cod liver oil daily and they used to have um, liver once a week and, and then you see all this, um, you know, needing glasses and you think, well, how could tribes live out in the wild if they couldn't see properly? And, and they, the, the answer was that the nutrition provided what they needed. So um, we, there's, there's a few different principles in, um, that, that we cover. Um, but... I have a very short time here to, to talk, so I, I know you guys want to have lunch. But um, one of the key findings is the animal food nutrients. And I, I've mentioned vitamin A because it's really quite an intense problem now, I think, because it's literally out of the diet of a lot of children, particularly. Um, but it, it's kind of... It, what I would like to emphasize is the, the holistic approach um, to kind of wrap up. It is, when, when we're looking at holistic farming, we're looking at the soil, how we treat the animals, how that impacts on the biodiversity. Um, when, when we look at that, if you then look at the nutrient content of the food with holistic farming, um, when, when the animal's out in the sunshine, they're creating vitamin D. They get vitamin A from the green grass, K2 from the fermentation in the gut. And with, when the soil is alive, the minerals are going to be there in the plants and then transferred to the animals who make it more available to us. And it, it's, it's thinking in that step further to how a lot of the problems in society human health, how you as farmers are actually, can, can, should be seen as, as the doctors um, of today. So a lot of farmers producing unpasteurized milk from pastured cows, they'll have customers who 
are aware of this, uh, aware that butter fat is important and it needs to be properly produced to provide the benefits. And I know um, a number of goat farmers in particular who they have the dry period um, just before um, kidding season and they will, hold, they will stop selling in the shops because they have children in their neighborhood who rely on it and they, they're told by the parents these kids will get sick. They'll, you know, kids with autism or really bad digestive issues, they need their nutrient-dense foods. And that's something and which is, is so important. I, and I'll just give one uh, little case study. Um, you know, my mother had osteoporosis, and, and we, she, she was on all the drugs and, and, and supplements that the uh, National Health Service give. And we said, no, no, come off those drugs because they don't really do the right thing. Introduce a few nutrient-dense foods. She's having organic um, vegetables, but not having all the fat-soluble vitamins. She's not, so we, we introduced raw milk, um, grass-fed butter, bone broth. Uh, encouraged her not to, um, uh, to have commercially baked bread, but sourdough bread. Introducing all these things. In, in less than two years, she had normal bone density. And the doctors had no idea. And we hear these kind of stories constantly. Um, so just moving from the soil to the person, the farmers, and then also the artisan food producers who follow on from the farmers, we really emphasize that, that I mentioned sourdough bread, for example, or there's all the unpasteurized dairy products like the cheeses and butters. So all these producers are, are, are making nutrients more and more available and really that's the kind of take-home message I'd like to give to um, to the farmers that the modern medicine model has, has really come to the end uh, uh, and we see that a and just taking that holistic model the next step to incorporating the human health angle and trying to educate people and that's what we do so it, it, please do come out to our booth um, we've got various flyers that you can take home and there, there are samples of our journal all the articles are free on our website westernaprice.org um, and we also have a conference in London uh, so if anyone's local or from the UK or Europe get on our mailing list and um, I'd be happy to chat to any of you afterwards but thank you again for the Savory Institute and I'd love to hopefully we can work more closely with you guys here I would love to do that all right thank you Philip so it's it's time for lunch and so we're gonna start with lunch in foyer B or in the atrium where they served cocktails last night uh, and then and then foyer A will open up after that. So they are ready to go, and then we'll meet back in here at one o'clock. Also, if you're looking to get books, the bookstore will be wrapping up early this afternoon, so this would be a good break to go ahead and buy any books that you were looking at. And be sure to visit Philip's booth. All right, thank you guys.